Good evening. I'd like to call the Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, May 20th, 2020 to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Mrs. Larson? Certainly. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Witkowski? Here. Mr. Alexandrovich? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Gamble? Here. Mr. Sprague? Here. And I am also here. We are all present. Thank you. And Dr. Miller, um, you'll take a mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, with the individuals who phoned in, please identify yourselves. Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Cohn, I think you have already identified yourself. Uh, hi there, it's Christine Cody, Director of Student Services. Okay. Hi, Chris Ryder, Director of Teaching and Learning. Okay, so we have three of our directors with us um, by phone. Okay, Thank well, you. If welcome. you could just please move, mute uh, and listen uh, in without your microphone. Okay, and the meeting has been properly posted. Uh, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For item three, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Witkowski, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item four is community comment. There is no community present. So we'll move on to item five, consent agenda. Does any board member want to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Motion by Mr. Sprague, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Alexandrovich. All those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. School board announcements, item six. Do we have any announcements? Uh, I would just like to say, um, last night I attended the CISO one convention out in Sussex and uh, it, it was in the um, Hamilton's one of their middle schools, their new middle school, and there were 45 delegates present there. Um, there were just two at a table, and it was a governmental meeting, so it was allowed. And um, I, I what Frank, so I represented Franklin, uh, and um, I was elected back to the board of control, and then I was also elected vice president. So um, we are represented for three years. So I wanted to let you know that. And then uh, item seven, school board calendar. We have a regular board of education meeting Wednesday, June 17th, 2020 here at the ECC at six o'clock PM. And a regular board of education meeting here, July 8th, 2020 here at the ECC at six o'clock PM. Item eight is a new agenda item, superintendent's update, Dr. Miller. issue for us right now is how how are we transitioning back back to work back to school and um, I'd like to assure you that we've been working very hard to to um, develop our plans for transitioning back to work um, there is a communication that's going to staff and then to families on Friday that essentially conveys there are two ways in which we'll return to school in fall we'll return face to face or we'll return virtually so um, we are working to determine the safest way that we can return face to face next fall. Um, we're looking at all of the recommendations by the CDC. They've come out with um, recommendations for returning to school. In addition to that, the DPI um, by the end of this week, I believe, I just spoke to John Bales actually before this meeting, will also have some recommendations and on how to do school how to run school face to face and do it in the safest way possible for our students. So we're working through all those various alternatives for how we can do that. Um, if we have to be virtual, we've learned a lot about how to do virtual school and we know we will be able to do it and we'll be able to do it even better if we are in a situation where we must be virtual. So we will communicate these plans as soon as we can uh, with everyone. Um, with regard to the ECC, we're also developing plans for bringing those employees back as well. 
So that will be starting um, very soon. So that is our transition planning that we're currently working on. The other thing I wanted to bring up this evening was some changes to Title IX, and I know that you received some things from WASD with regard to these changes. Um, on May 6, the U.S. Department of Education released new regulations around Title IX that pertain specifically to um, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, and sexual assault. Um, we have some very specific things that we need to do as a school district to make sure that we are complying with these new regulations. Um, we have to have those things in place by August 14th. So Ms. Ellihausen and I have begun discussions about what policies need to be revised, who needs to be trained, um, and what communication modes will be put in place to comply with those regulations. So I'll be giving you more information about that as we work through this this summer. So those are two updates that I thought would be pertinent and important for you to hear about this evening. Thank you. Does does any board member have a, a brief comment or question about the updates? I would. I'm just kind of curious about what you said face to face and trying to imagine what mm -hmm. that would look like. It's mm -hmm. to me, it's like you got 25 kids in a classroom. What, what half stay home? I, I can't imagine what you're you looking know. at. Yeah, so certainly there are districts who develop some plans where half of the children stay home. It is something we're we're looking at, but frankly, that is a nightmare for parents. So mm -hmm. it's not something that we would want to consider, but I can't say it's entirely off the table. We have to look at everything. So what that does mean is that um, we would have children in a classroom, um, socially distanced um, in the best ways possible. Is it going to be perfect? Can we do six feet? Nope, but we're gonna do what we can. And you so, said DPI is going to give their recommendation mm -hmm. at the end of the week. Hopefully, end of the week, yeah. Mm -hmm. On um, how to how to safely bring children. Uh, the the safest ways to bring children back is probably the best way to describe. Because you can't do everything that the CDC would recommend you would do. Um, not everyone can do. Smaller districts, perhaps, but larger districts, you know, everybody's in a little bit different situation with their ability. Franklin must bus all of our students, so that puts us in a situation where busing is a huge factor with um, social distancing and conducting school. So there are no orders in place. There are no rules that tell us what we must do anymore, um, but we do care greatly about the safety of our students and whatever plan we put together, I'll bring back to the board. I guess based on what you said, it seems like you know, remote lo learning would be the safest thing. Why would you not do that? But, but statistically, now, now if you look at the statistics of the whole virus, there are approximately 1.3 million uh, 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 people under age 19 in the state of Wisconsin. And of those 1.3 million people, last I heard, which was last week, 20 had ended up in the hospital with COVID-19. And of those 20, one ended up in intensive care. So statistically, if you look at it statistically and let the science rule, the likelihood of having a huge problem is probably not there with students under age 19. So, I mean, we have to consider the science. You know, everybody says, look at the science. Well, that's the science so far. So, you know, face-to-face -face student learning may not be that bad. Now, then you have to consider the teachers. You know, they probably be more at risk than the kids are. So, I mean, there, there's a lot to consider. I totally understand that. But let's look at the science and look at how it really affects the students right. or the mm -hmm. children. Yeah, we, we do definitely do track the data on a daily basis mm -hmm. as well as any new findings with regard to health conditions. Yep. There, there was just one that was released yesterday with 
with regard to children. Okay. And um, there are some illnesses that are showing up with children that are related to COVID now. So that's something to watch, but definitely we, we, we have to do that. But at some point we have to make a decision as well. Mm -hmm. We can't wait to the last minute to say we're going virtual or we're going face to face. So, um, but we, I think we all know that there's potential that if you're face to face, you could you know, quickly be out as a virtual school again. But as communities and, and families return to work, we need to be responsive to mm -hmm. you know, families and their need for children to be in school. So there, there's a lot of things that we're talking about and considering at this time. But also as we're opening up and going back to work and restaurants, et cetera, are opening, we'll find out over the course of the next couple of months whether or not things are right. going crazy. And that'll have an impact on how we have to treat it too. Absolutely. So there's a lot more data to come. Right. Anyone else? Would parents have choice? Providing um, an education to uh, children in the virtual world and at school with our system staffing, it, it would be a bit of a challenge to do that. Their choice is to go to a virtual school besides yeah. Franklin. Yeah, we don't we don't have a virtual school. Um, you know, we've delivered education virtually. We don't have a virtual school in our district. that would not attend and we definitely have mm -hmm. the responsibility to educate them attendance is mandatory I, I hear nothing about the laws changing with regard to students attending school <coughs> so more more to come yeah. I, and there's a financial consideration though if they become students of a virtual school they're not in our student count Thank you, Dr. Miller. You're welcome. Okay, item nine, reports, presentations, and other school board business. 9A, the 2020-21 staffing report. Ms. Ellahausen. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see all of you. Um, I am here tonight to present the staffing report. This is, um, although we live in very different times, we're still in that planning phase for next school year. Uh, there are still statutory Obviously another factor would be attrition or turnover of our teaching staff and how that makes for adjustments in the way in which we staff. Um, but certainly the principals, uh, the director of teaching and learning, uh, Mr. Milder and I work in collaboration on this report. Um, within the main uh, report page that highlights the overall staffing levels, we certainly are um, projecting an increase. Where is that increase predominant? from um, the enrollment at Forest Park Middle School. So as we take a look and again, if you think back to the November report that I drew for the board around enrollments and staffing, we are seeing that migration of some of the bigger classes move into Forest Park where their enrollment will be over 1,100 students next year um, as projected. And so as a result of that, we need to staff accordingly to our policies around class size and then student selection and exploratories, that results then 
in the general increase to Forest Park. Not a major increase, certainly not the same as what you saw last year upon the opening of Forest Park. What I would say is a more typical pattern for Franklin um, as we should also remember we, we, we maintain ourselves as a growing enrollment district. We, we are not a declining enrollment district and we often see uh, migration in. A good example of that would be as we watch the enrollment projection even today Southwood Glen continues to show an increase albeit modest in enrollment predominantly due to the new subdivision uh, that, that has uh, transpired down there. So that's the overall now the tables in between are your breakdown by our levels um, and then on page 8 you see that staffing allocation summary that brings kind of an overall um, snapshot of what you what I've highlighted or what you see in each of those levels at our elementary you see very flat staffing needs we're, we're pretty much next year projecting next year what we have this year why is that? Because we have stable enrollment there. Uh, we have made adjustments in the past couple of years around those lo lower primary numbers that are slightly smaller than some of our other class sizes at grades six, seven, and eight. And we are again moving into the second year of 4K, so there's no expected changes there. We are on track to see about 300 students based upon our current enrollments, uh, which We've confirmed as of this past week with assignments to parents and then continuing to see new enrollment come in. It still allows for us to maintain our class sizes according to the board policy and stable needs in those exploratory and special education areas. Um, I addressed a little bit the middle as the highlight for the overall increase, but again, the middle references that need to adjust staffing to accommodate the 1,100 students um, and certainly with the HELP model, we're um, using that model as the design around the grade level and then the encore selections accordingly. The elimination of Japanese you see referenced in both the middle and the high and you were made aware of that um, program change when we were unable to fill in that area um, and so you see some of those numbers reallocated Within the high school, we have um, at the science curriculum review, we have an additional FTE in science. Um, that is explained in letter A there on page eight. And then the decrease in the exploratories due to some of that, again, that reallocation of certain courses um, around uh, family and consumer science as well as Japanese. And then in the overall district-wide support, uh, it is again a very flat um, net, not net zero on the enrollment or the staffing changes, um, but some shifting between um, literacy and math coaching levels based upon needs. The end of the report really is a forecast for you, so you can again kind of think back or um, relate to the way in which staffing works. I would say we are on track for a typical year, potentially even a lower year. Um, again, it's very different times. Uh, it, within the overall WeCan database, which WeCan is the predominant system for applicant tracking in the state of Wisconsin. Um, most of our 437 districts use WeCan, and, and there's even more because many of our charter schools are private schools and our parochial schools. Overall, within the weekend system, the migration patterns are down, meaning the applicant pool depth is a little bit lower and, and staff moving between districts is lower in applications. Um, why might that be? Because again, it's a little uncertain, right? You just talked about where are we heading for the fall, where are we sitting now? And so every district is being a little bit lesser in their turnover at this point in time. Can I say for certain that's where we're going to land? No, but that's my projection around what I'm seeing, which I, as 
processes against what I'm typically seeing at this point in time. For the most part, based upon our overall vacancies, we're, we're actually almost done. We really have less than five to fill at this point in time. Um, we've, we've done a great job of That's really my overview on the report. I will certainly answer any questions or um, have one of those collaborators on the plan, albeit on the phone, or Dr. Miller beside me, assist with any questions you have as well. Before we begin, um, Mr. Mazur, is there some way to increase the volume of this? I was checking in with our guests, and if it could be just a bit louder, it would be helpful. Thank you. question? Yeah, sorry, just one. Okay. Are the district-wide support, those are all certified staff, certified teachers? Yes, they're required to have a license. Yep. And the house size, a house is two classrooms, two teachers? What? How do you define house as a? It's a two-person house. Two-person house. Mm -hmm. And so 60 kids? It, well, our, again, our class size policy around three through eight is less than 30. Less than 30. So we certainly strive to keep six, seven, and eight, no different than fifth at that number. Our overall uh, house size, Linda, sits at around 27 at those grade levels. And we add, we're adding one house at the, the middle school, so. Yes, because the incoming, um, so our, our biggest class, uh, at the middle school next year will be the eighth grade at 392 students. And then we are bringing in a class of 362 students. Was the eighth grade just a little bit smaller yes. by happenstance or was it because of that old school and now it's a new school and more people are, mm -hmm. more people want to be there? Or no, do we, know the um, we did. We did see when we opened Forest Park last year. We did see an increase in resident enrollment. We do not have open enrollment seats there, Mr. Sprague, um, but we did see an increase of our resident students. Not by any mass that created the need for the staffing. This is really those grade levels that sit in the upper three hundreds that as they move through the system, right, the staffing patterns follow them, as opposed to, again, when you look at our current first grade number of 300. So you think about the difference between 300, 392, 300, and 362, that is a house. Sure, absolutely, I'm just, yeah. just wondering why the, why the number changed. Eighth grade seems small. Um, so you said Southwood Glen is is getting bigger, and I know talking with Dr. Mowbray, they're adding a couple of sections, maybe maybe two total. Did the other, some of the other schools go down a little bit? Yes. Is that? Yes, and you see that represented at the overall grade levels mm -hmm. on the elementary page, particularly fifth grade. Any other questions? Yes. What is the capacity of the middle school? Good question. Um, because I know we have 1,100 students there this year. Mr. Yeah. Milzer, do you recall the, the capacity of the school? I thought that was, that was closing in on us. Yeah, I believe it's just over 1,200. Mm -hmm. I can look it up to be sure, but I believe that's where it is. Oh, well, we do have that bigger cushion. Okay, good. I, I thought you told me that um, when we were going through it last year, I thought it was 450 per class was the, was the limit. The total? That's that's what I thought what you said, mm -hmm. 1350. I'll take a look. Is, is that what it is currently? Because I know we built it in such a way that uh, we mm -hmm. could add to it. So that's the 
current, mm -hmm. or is that the full capacity? Mm -hmm. that, that's current. That's okay. without those additional classrooms that could be added. Okay. Any other questions? Linda, did you? I thought you had. I'm your good. Hand up. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have 9B, the Pleasant View office update. Mr. Milzer. Yes, in March uh, we talked about the, the Pleasant View office and the fact that it was the only building we had that didn't have a secure entrance where people are buzzed in and out of the office uh, because the office is in the center of the building. Uh, we've started working on that and I provided a draft of some uh, images for you uh, of the project. Uh, it isn't finalized yet, but um, on the first page you can see generally where that entrance is right next to the gym. Uh, it's in a spot where as you approach the building you would expect the entrance to be. Uh, and on the second page uh, it just shows the current configuration and what those areas are used for uh, in the dotted lines. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that is a diagram of the first floor which shows the areas in, uh, highlighted in yellow uh, that are changing. Uh, in the center and the top is the new office area and on the right is where the office used to be that becomes a classroom um, because the new office does take up a classroom. Uh, after that there's a picture of the current entrance where the new secure entrance would be uh, and then a picture of the office where it is now kind of in that hallway uh, and then there's a few renderings that show the new secure entrance from the front, uh, view of the office from the outside, uh, and there's a canopy at the gym entrance that was added. Uh, students arrive and leave there from parent pickup, and it gives them a spot to be outside to see their parents when it's raining and, and not get all wet while they're doing that. Uh, and then uh, there's renderings that show the inside of the new office and uh, the secure entrance and you can see the sight lines in the office are very good to the outside to see who's coming up to the building. Um, the glass will be the resistant glass we're using now, resistant to entry like we've used at the other office locations. And uh, we're looking at the project starting in July. We've submitted paperwork to the city planning department uh, at this point. They're reviewing it. We haven't heard back from them, uh, but we hope to soon. And the uh, estimated cost at this point is about 1.75 million. That'll be coming from Fund 46, which is our long-term capital projects fund. And really, we're, we're able to do this because of our strong financial position and our stewardship of our finances, that we can do this without borrowing money or asking the public uh, to pay for this in addition to the money that they give us to operate. Um, so that's kind of where we're at at this point. Uh, there's probably another couple of weeks of um, integration in our, our drawings and so forth uh, before we come to a final, final drawing on this. And we hope to hear back soon from the city so we can stay on track uh, with getting this done. But it will take six, six to seven months to finish it. One piece has to be finished before the other piece can be started. The city just hired last night the new replacement for Mr. Deedle, so I saw that, that yeah. might help. Uh -huh. Hopefully that's good news for us. Yeah. Any questions? So that is uh, an increase in the original cost estimate. I think it was 1.6 and we're at 1.75. Yeah, we added um, not only that canopy, but there's um, Around the office, there are several bathrooms, a pair of student <coughs> bathrooms, and then three uh, staff bathrooms that needed to be redone. Um, they're very old. Uh, they didn't have the correct kind of flush valves and so forth. So as long as we're tearing into that whole area, uh, we added that uh, as well. And in the, um, the, the building will be having the 4K and kindergarten students in that area. So those bathrooms are kind of being redone for that size student uh, because they'll be using those bathrooms most often. Um, 
So the, the glass, there's a lot of glass. I, see, I understand the glass around the corridor where you're coming in, but the, you know, the big glass. Mm -hmm. How much does that add to the cost? It seems just a bit more than you might need. Um, it'll, it allows for the staff to see outside and who's coming and who's going where. So, so that's the advantage to it. Um, I don't have a figure for you on what that would cost if it was a block wall versus a, a glass wall. I, I don't know as the cost would be that different because you're paying for a lot of labor. The more you, you build up with brick or something like that. I just think of heat and all that going on too. Yeah. Well, these are brand new windows that are that are made for our climate, so they aren't they aren't like the single pane old school windows that fog up and you're wiping them down during the day. Will that glass have the safety film on it? Um, it it won't have an added safety film. It's actually built with that right in it when we buy new glass. Any other questions? I guess I'm okay for that. I mean, I think it's more than we need, but. I would just add that, you know, Pleasant View School is um, a well-maintained school, one that we'll have in the district for a long time to come. And I think it's an important uh, addition for safety, but also just to um, maintain our schools, our school uh, for, for use of our children. Just one final. So, Jim, when do we add the everything, the newest part there, the gym and all that? When did we add that? You know, uh, 1995. It's almost like we could have done this then. I mean, it's so obviously a better location than that space we had. I, As a parent, who has gone there many times. And went yeah. There. I could give you a list of $50 million worth of projects that <laughs> it would make sense to do. So right. I'm glad to hear that you're in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure in 1995 there were the security issues. Yeah, the right. security right. issues have totally there, changed since so. then. So we oh, weren't really thinking yeah. about it's the location good. of the office at the time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Milter. Item 9C, the treasurer's report is available in the board docs library. Item 10, school board liaison reports, uh, 9A. Um, I did not receive any uh, public comments in email, um, which we are allowing uh, during this social distancing time. So uh, 9B, personnel and policy, policy 5223, questionable materials, activities, organizations regarding Students, this is an action item. Mrs. Larson. Yes. So <clears throat> Dr. M uh, Miller and I were corresponding with each other, and after we corresponded with each other, we came up with the idea that we had two possibilities on this policy. One, we could rewrite the policy and create new policy language, and then put the bulk of that into the administrative rules, or we could just simply eliminate that policy. Um, admin, we, um, recommends elimination of the policy. Um, Mr. Volo weighed in, as did Mrs. King on it, and they are also comfortable with eliminating the policy. Um, the policy is very um, written very specifically. It's very um, rigid. It, um, disrupt the disruptive behavior that it talks about in that policy is covered in our school handbooks. Um, we have guidelines in our school handbooks for activities and organizations that want to form. Um, as well as we have an anti-discrimination policy that covers things that are in this current policy. Dr. Miller? Um, I would just say that um, I did a little research on this policy and it was last review, well, it was a review date on one of the policies was 1991. So it originated a long time ago for some particular reason that isn't really one that is uh, of issue right now for us. Um, so um, as Ms. Larson said, um, upon review of this, we find that much of what's in here is found in other policies of the board already um, and or our practices with regard to um, how we um, accept new organizations into the school district. So um, with that, I 
it isn't a required policy. It's not even recommended by the WASB for having policy language. So I, I support uh, eliminating uh, policy 5223. So in our in the agenda here, well, under our content, it says recommended action is to approve revised, not eliminate. So mm -hmm. you've changed course. Mm -hmm. Yep. I apologize for that. That's okay. There, there was still some discussion occurring about this um, after the posting yeah. of the agenda. So we're looking for a motion to eliminate policy 5223. So moved. Motion by Mrs. Larson. Is there a second? Step? Second by Mr. Lewis, any discussion? Um, I, I do wanna just say that, so I believe it was last year we had an issue uh, that was brought forward here by a student, student with an organization. Um, I, I don't know if the board remembers, she, the group wanted a, an organization mm -hmm. and it was handled well, I believe, by the high school. So all of that, if you recall what happened, would be covered, you believe, under handbooks. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, school board policy, um, yeah. uh, student athletics and activities, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of elimination say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, um, personnel and policy, policy 5367, Technical Education Eye Protection Program. Mrs. Larson. Yes, um, this is another policy that admin is re, um, recommending that we eliminate. Uh, the policy is old. It's based upon an old document from 1994. Eye protection is already required in um, other areas of the school, such as science, the science classrooms, the pool, and our staff ensures that these rules are followed. So we're looking for a motion to eliminate policy 5367, Technical Education Eye Protection Program. Do we hear that motion? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Larson, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Larson. Item 11, closed session. I'm looking for a motion to enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute 19.85, sub 1, sub E, to discuss land purchase. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Uh, motion by Mrs. Witkowski, second by Mr. Gamble. Um, can we have a roll call, please, Mr. Larson? Yes. Mrs. Witkowski? Aye. Mr. Alexandrovich? Aye. Mr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Gamble? Aye. Mr. Sprague? Aye. I vote aye. Mrs. Evans? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries. And we are in closed session at 638. Uh, 